You're listening to the Weekend Sport Podcast with Jason Pine from Newstalk ZB. Football Fever with Newstalk ZB's voice of football, Jason Pine and Bonnie Jansen. Welcome to Football Fever. I'm Jason Pine. No Bonnie Jansen today. She is off uh, rubbing shoulders and mixing with the stars at the Australian Tennis Open. She is back next week, though. But uh, a bit to get through from the weekend past. Let's start this episode with the Wellington Phoenix men. Massive drama on Friday night in their top of the table clash against Melbourne Victory. Down to 10 men just before half time when Tim Payne was sent off, initially shown a yellow card by referee Daniel Elder, upgraded on the advice of the VAR to a red. So Wellington are down to 10 with the entire second half to play. Backs to the wall defending, all hands on deck in that second half. Holding Melbourne victory out until the 79th minute. Connor Chapman then diverting home and Shamvalupale shot to score what looked as though it would be the winning goal. But then... The Phoenix just found a way. A penalty awarded deep into added time, slotted home with a plom by Captain Alex Roofer to earn his side a point and keep them at the top of the A-League men's ladder. Alex Roofer was asked afterwards about his decision to step up and take the penalty. I'm positive, I'm confident to, to take a penalty, but look, I actually would like to say just a quick thank you to Costa because it's not normal that a striker who's scoring every week is humble enough to... You know, let me take the penalty. So that just shows how much of a, you know, not only a great player that he is, but a you know massive team man. But I'm confident to take them. But look, at the end of the day, it's not about who takes it as long as they score. You know, and and I did that tonight. So you're just really, um, really thankful and really happy. Here. He was then asked about the exact conversation that had taken place between he and Costa Barbarousas. I'd said to him that I'd like to take it, and he he grabbed the the ball for me. He just said to me, "Look, stay calm, just focus," and and that's what we did. But yeah, like I said, if he said to me at the time. He, he wanted it, no problem. But yeah, no, he, he was brilliant. He just had to stay calm. He's been in those moments. He, he, he's a calm presence and, um, yeah, just a massive team man and he's, uh, he's brilliant. So what did coach Giancarlo Italiano make of it all? Yeah, it was good, but I didn't see it. So I don't watch penalties because I, I can't handle them. So I was, in the, I was in the corner just, you know, watching the crowd's reaction. So I didn't even know Riffs actually took the penalty, to be fair because I turned around as soon as the penalty was given. Incredible stuff from Giancarlo Italiano. The Chief is deeply superstitious. He throws away shirts that he wears when his team loses. So after the Newcastle game and after the Sydney FC game, the shirts that he was wearing on those two nights uh, have been chucked in the bin. (laughs) He doesn't wear the same shirt if his team loses a game. Jeepers, you wouldn't want to go on a losing run, would you? You'd be uh, going through the wardrobe. Like nothing else. Thankfully for the Chief, it's been uh, more wins and draws than losses this season. Ice call from Alex Rufa, who topped what was another terrific game, playing as well as I can remember in his time at the club. And it was just awesome to see the Yellow Fever chanting his name after the game as he made his way off down the tunnel. It was a, a terrific moment. thought centre-back Scott Wooten was absolutely outstanding. Finn Sermon alongside, not far behind. And really impressed with the impact off the bench of Oscar Van Hattem. Came on, had a shot himself, which was inches wide, and then earned the penalty when uh, he got himself advanced on the end of a Ben Old pass and compelled Jason Guerrier to commit a rather clumsy challenge which led to the uh, the awarding of the penalty. Unreal second half heart from the 10 men of Wellington. I do feel for Melbourne victory, I have to say, they did all but enough to win the game. Jake Brimmer, superb in their engine room. Daniel Arzani, a menace all night. But football is a game of moments. And Wellington seized theirs. Giancarlo Italiano was asked what the message was at half time with his side down to 10 men. I'm not going to say the words that I used at half-time, but I, it was more about discipline, structure, uh, more about the collective and just grinding out the performance. And we train for this all the time. You know, we have scenarios of training where we put pressure on oppositions and we, you know, make everything a uh, uh, results orientated. So it gets them in the mindset that, uh, you know, when these things happen, that they're mentally ready to go through it. So... Again, I feel uh, the response uh, once we conceded it was, was very good. I mean, I don't mind saying that, you know, at half time, I was happy to take a draw from the game with the intent that 
if you know if the space opened up that we could exploit them and, and, and potentially get a win but my focus was not losing at half time so that was more why we had a defensive approach but once we went one nil down uh, you know we you know we just went full pelt and nothing that the boys haven't trained before so they did quite well and just Giancarlo Italiano's thoughts on the sending off of Tim Payne I want to go back on the video because from my angle I felt as though when he made the challenge, his foot was already down when he's come through the ball. I couldn't tell whether or not there was um, actual contact. I, I, I know that there must have been some contact for the uh, for the card to be given. Now, with his foot down and his planting foot coming like almost directly on the on the challenge, I felt like uh, it's very hard to establish intent. And it was it's not even reckless. It's just more just the fraction of uh, of a second timing. So I felt that was harsh. But again, if I see the replay at a closer angle, uh, I'm I'm happy to admit if I'm wrong. That was exact. Uh, sorry, uh, immediately after the game from Giancarlo Italiano, uh, the Phoenix haven't appealed the yellow, uh, the red card, or the, or the upgrade of the yellow to a red. I think it was a red card. I think Tim Payne accepts it was a bit reckless. It's hit uh, Mashash uh, on the shin. Uh, his studs have got him on the shin. I think it's a red card. Tim Payne will miss at least one week. Uh, so that provides a selection conundrum for Giancarlo Italiano at right back with Tim Payne suspended for the trip to Newcastle on Saturday night. It's a position in the Phoenix squad where there doesn't seem to be a heck of a lot of apparent depth. Nicholas Pennington slotted in there on Saturday, or rather Friday night. So he could, this coming Saturday, start there in what would be his 50th game. Mohamed El Tay has played a little bit at right back. And Matt Sheridan, one of the youngsters in the team, is also potentially an option there. We wait to find out. Just a word on the absolute morons who decided it would be a good idea to start some fights with the travelling Melbourne Victory fans. It was just terrific to see a, uh, a good number of Melbourne Victory fans there in the stands making the trip across the Tasman. The last thing they needed was for some idiots to uh, think it was a, a bright idea to start giving them a bit of jib near the end. General Manager of the Phoenix, David Dome, has said they will weed them out and give them life bans. I 100% back that. Yellow Fever, the Phoenix support base, has always welcomed travelling fans from other clubs, made a point of inviting them to to pre- and post-match events and and really roll out the red carpet. And these few idiots absolutely do not represent the Wellington Phoenix fan base. And just on that, and to flip it on its head and make it a positive, incredible noise and support from the fans on Friday, a huge vote of congratulations to the over 9,000 who turned up and shouted themselves hoarse in support of their team on Friday. The Phoenix normally kick from uh, right to left on the screen, from south to north in the first half of matches and tend to come back towards the yellow fever in the second half. It was the opposite on Friday night. I'm not exactly sure why that happened. I get the feeling that Roderick Miranda from the victory probably won the toss and elected to, to, to kick towards the yellow fever in the second half rather than in the first half. Anyway, for whatever reason, it was the opposite. And I actually think it helped the Phoenix as they defended with 10 men all the way down that end, the southern end, for pretty much the entire second half with yellow fever behind their backs. I thought their support was an immeasurable help to the team. Just before we move on, not every Wellington Phoenix team of the past gets a draw in a situation like that. Not every Phoenix team in the past is able to hold out a very, very good attacking side like Melbourne Victory until the 80th minute before conceding. And certainly not every Wellington Phoenix team of the past has the wherewithal to then change their mentality at 1-0 down with 10 men against a very good defensive team, go down the other end and find a way to find an equaliser. So back to Alex Rufa just finally. He's been there through the thick and the thin of this team for a long time now. He was after, after asked afterwards whether there is something just a little bit special about this team. Yeah, definitely. I've, like you said, I've been here a long time, and I've been through a lot here, and there's always games that happen like that during the season. Like Every year there's always something like that, but I have to say there is something special in this group, and um, like we've got a lot of characters, um, a lot of youth, a lot of energy, um, very, very positive around the place, and... You know, I think for us now it's about just staying grounded, staying humble and um, you know, keep working hard during the week because that's where you set the, the platform for the, for the game and 
we're very, very honest. So for us, nothing changes. Now we our focus has to shift towards next week and um, against Newcastle, and that's the most important thing. Football Fever on iHeartRadio. Let's go to the Wellington Phoenix women. They went down 2-1 to league leaders Melbourne City on Saturday evening. A fourth straight defeat and a third straight 2-1 loss. Melbourne City 2-0 up after 74 minutes, but Mariana Speckmeyer scored four minutes later to keep Wellington in the contest. Here is the immediate post-match reaction of Phoenix women's coach Paul Temple. Well, I think we had a really good response, which is what I wanted to see, and I was proud of them, you know, like... It's, it was very hot in the first half and um, this is the team that's top of the league and um, and to come away from home and, and we had to put in a huge effort and they did and we were collective, we stuck together, there was fight out there, there was spirit, you could see it in the performance um, and then as I say we, we had that plan to kind of really go for it um, later on in the game and when we had the, the energy and the moment was right and on another day you know those things are uh, those things go for us, but um, yeah, you know, there's there's some there's still some really disappointing things um, that are happening that I think um, yeah have been happening to us for a few weeks now. We're just really not getting the rub of the green when it comes to decisions and, and big moments in the game. Um, yeah, I, I felt there was two very clear fouls um, on the touchline in the lead up to their second goal that that the officials missed and. And ultimately, they went straight down, and within two passes, they were putting it in the back of the net. So those things just seem to be going against us at the moment. And um, yeah, there's, there's not too much you can do about it. You just kind of got to take it on the chin and keep moving forward. So fairly philosophical from Paul Temple, who had asked for a response from his team after the uh, the three previous defeats, and I think he got it. This was much better from the Phoenix. The second half, in particular, was their best second half for for quite some time, uh, probably for. Half a dozen games. This was their best second half. Just want to make mention of the ongoing performances of Captain Annalie Longo. She just keeps driving this side on in her actions and her words. I know she's a um, she's a very vocal uh, skipper, but just the way she plays the game is is hugely impressive for me. So uh, kudos to Annalie Longo, who under the pressure of everything else that's going on at that football club at the moment. Um, is continuing to lead from the front. I thought the energy Zoe McMeekin provided off the bench was excellent. Uh, I think she's really pushing hard for that starting right-back spot. And Mackenzie Barry uh, continues to impress, although she was forced off in this game with a hamstring niggle. Hopefully she'll be okay for the weekend. The Phoenix are ninth, but just two points outside the top six. They're back home this weekend for the first time since December 23rd, so over a month. Since they've played a home game, that's when they beat Newcastle 2-0 at Sky Stadium. They play in Porirua on Sunday, 5 o'clock kickoff against Canberra United. Canberra a 11th currently on the table. Michelle Heyman is their big attacking threat, having brought up 100 Liberty A-League goals and scored four in the last two matches. Uh, one cap football fern Devin Jackson is also on the Canberra roster. So how much are Paul Temple and the side looking forward to getting home after a month of away games? Well, oh, it feels like more than four weeks, I'll tell you that. <laughs> it feels like an eternity. It was last year that we were playing at home. Um, so, yeah, look, we're really looking forward to getting back and playing a home game. Um, this run has, has been testing. You know, it's uh, it's very draining, physically, emotional, um, draining to, to come away from home every week. And just in a row, it's uh, it's been a very, very tough January in terms of travel, um, this is a time of year that most Kiwis are with their families and having time off. And the girls and the staff are having to week after week get on a plane, get Australia, get on a plane, get Australia, rinse and repeat. Um, the TAB have started cancelling 2-1 defeats for us. <laughs> they've, they've, they've called off all bets. It's just um, a bit of deja vu. Um, but it's, yeah, look, it's, it's, it's very, very tough um, when you have this many away games in a row. Um, so... We are very much looking forward to being at home next weekend and hopefully um, the Wellingtonians come out and get down to Poirua Park and, and we can turn this run around and, and get back on the get back on the horse and, and win next week and kickstart the second half of the season. It does feel like a great opportunity 
to do just that, to get this season back on track, to start playing the way that this team was in the early part of the season that saw them up in the top three for a long time. Let's hope for a good crowd at Jerry Collins Stadium in Porirua and an upswing in fortunes for the Wellington Phoenix women. Football. Football fever. Let's uh, turn our attention to Kiwis playing overseas. Quite a few to get through. Chris Wood on the score sheet again for Nottingham Forest. That's six goals in his last six games. Unfortunately, not enough to see them avoid a 3-2 defeat against Brentford. But Chris Wood now has 63 Premier League goals. That's more than David Beckham, more than Gianfranco Zola, more than Aussie stars, Harry Kuehl or Tim Cahill, and just two fewer than Kevin De Bruyne. He is a genuine Premier League striker who is playing and scoring for fun right now and long may that continue. Great to see Sarpreet Singh getting a start for Hansa Rostock. They have a new boss who's familiar with Sarpreet from their time together at Regensburg so hopefully Sarpreet will start getting plenty more minutes. A clean sheet and a man of the match performance from all white goalkeeper Max Crocombe in his latest outing at Burton Albion and just on goalkeepers actually a bit closer to home. Great to see Ollie Sale back in the Perth glory side for the first time since round two of the A-League. A good solid performance from Ollie Sale, despite the concession of a late own goal. A header from Western Sydney Wanderers defender Marcelo, rebounding off the post into Ollie Sale and then back across the line. But but that notwithstanding, I think he, he, um, he played well and should be back in the uh, number one slot in Perth Glory side. Libby Kakachi came off the bench for Empoli as they secured a pretty important 3-0 win over Monza as they look to climb out of the Serie A relegation zone. India Paige Riley on the score sheet for PSV. She grabbed their second goal in a 3-1 win over Telstar in the women's Eredivisie. Vic Hessen got another start in goal for Rangers. They had a 3-2 win over Celtic in their Sky Sports Cup semi-final. Rhea Percival's on loan at Crystal Palace. She came off the bench to help them earn a 2-0 win over the London City Lionesses. Uh, Grace Neville played the full game for the Lionesses. No sign of Paige Satchel, though, in their matchday squad. And Katie Kitching started and played a key role in Sunderland's 3-0 win over Sheffield United. And to finish, Jackie Hand. She debuted for her new club, Lewis FC, a one-all draw against Durham. She started the game and played 67 minutes in her first match. A lot of excitement around about Jackie Hand and what she might achieve in her still pretty young football career. I had the chance to catch up with her on News Talk ZB over the weekend and uh, asked her to reflect back on the 2023 Women's World Cup and uh, how she felt about it with six months hindsight. Yeah, I mean, sometimes it still doesn't feel real. I think there was just, yeah, so many amazing aspects to the World Cup. And I think, yeah, just looking back, I think just so proud of what we were able to do and the involvement of you know, girls in football now, you know, six, seven months on is is just so much bigger than it was before the World Cup. And I think just seeing those types of things emerge from it, it's just, it's really cool to see. That opening night against Norway at Eden Park, the 1-0 win that, uh, that captured the imagination of the sporting nation. It was your pass that led to Hannah Wilkinson's match-winning goal in that game. Can you remember back to, to what you were thinking in, in the, the few seconds as that move was playing out and, and, and you played such a major part in it? <laughs> That's a funny question. I think, yeah, I mean, just saw the ball coming and I was just like, run, go. And then I knew Wilkie was in there and I was like, just get it to her. I think it all, I mean, it was it all happened so fast, even from when Bowen kicked the ball, so... I think, yeah, it's, it's, it felt like slow motion, but it also felt like just no time at all. And I think just seeing it like it was slow motion, seeing the ball hit the back of the net, that's for sure. And just like, yeah, the feeling is just indescribable. In moments like that, when you've got the ball and you look up and you see Hannah Wilkinson in the box, uh, it, does instinct take over? Or what what goes through your mind? Do you think, okay, I'll get the pass in, or do you do you start thinking about taking the ball into the penalty area yourself? What is going through your mind in moments like that? Yeah, I think honestly, we when I was in Finland, uh, one of our biggest work ons, um, one of our biggest like style to play was to was to get it down the side, kind of like how I got it. And so I'd actually been in that position, you know, countless times from playing in Finland. And so I think, I just think it was, yeah, I probably weighed up the options and, and obviously it's one, two seconds moment and just knew that Wilkie was there and, and 
was like that's our best option of scoring. But yeah, like I said, we, we, that's how we played in Finland. So it was quite funny that that's how the goal came about. My coach, you know, reminds me, or my coach from Finland reminds me that, you know, <laughs> he's saying, oh, that's how we played. But yeah, it's really cool. <laughs> it's it's a game of such small margins, isn't it? Because in the two games that followed, you know, you were involved a couple of times. There was a goal you scored in Wellington, but it was chalked off because I think half of Hannah Wilkinson's shoulder was offside in the build up to it then down in Dunedin you you hit the post with a with a volley it is such a game of small margins isn't it do you ever think about what might happen if those margins had fallen in your favor yeah for sure i think um probably as the time's gone on i haven't thought about those as much but definitely you know after right after when we we're done i mean of course you're going over those those moments in your head but i mean Overall, it was such an amazing experience that, you know, I just took so many positives from it that I think, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't really look back as, uh, on those as quite negative things, but obviously, you know, you can always say, what if, what if that happened? But I mean, it was, it was amazing that night against Norway. And, and yeah, I mean, it's something to build on for now. And you rightly earned uh, very, very positive reviews for the way you played uh, one of the standout players for New Zealand during that, that World Cup. How happy were you personally with the way you played in those three games? I think I was pretty happy. <laughs> I think, you know, I've been working on a few things, you know, quite quite a lot in, in Finland and with my coach and, and alongside Yitka as well. And I think it was kind of all of that coming together for me. And I was, yeah, I was really happy and proud that I was able to kind of put those performances together. That is Jackie Hand, uh, set to play a big role in the Football Ferns this year and beyond. Olympics, of course, uh, in the middle of this year. Olympic qualifying for the Football Ferns takes place in Apia next month. That's Football Fever for another week. Bonnie Jansen back to join me next Monday. This coming weekend, the Wellington Phoenix men up against Newcastle. Saturday night, 8 o'clock New Zealand time, McDonald Jones Stadium in Newcastle. And the Wellington Phoenix women take on Canberra Sunday, 5 o'clock, at Potidua Park. Look forward to seeing you next week. Football Fever, powered by News Talks at B. For more from Weekend Sport with Jason Pine, listen live to News Talks at B weekends from midday or follow the podcast on iHeartRadio.